Okay, so this video is a short and hopefully sweet review of the Canon EOS R6 Mark II, R6 Mark II. In summary, if I was starting out today with regards to creating content, maybe even client work, or just even personal shenanigans of capturing memories with family and things like that, this would be the camera to go to. You might be thinking, well, 2,500 bucks might be a lot of money for something like that. Might be true, right? That's what this retails for. But I gotta say, using this camera for the last week after sending back the Canon R8, which I had rented for a week prior to that, the thing that I was kind of reminded of was the joy that I had when I first got the, the Lumix, although I bought it used, right? When it first came out, I bought this camera used. Um, this camera, when it first retailed, it retailed for about $2,000 back in like what, 2017, if I'm correct. Now, 2017, $2,000 adjusted for inflation in 2023 is about $2,500. So in terms of the cost, price, size, the handling value, these two cameras are just about the same, right? Same in terms of uh, in terms of the size, the build, but the difference is that what you get in the Canon R6 Mark II over the GH5, uh, I think the value definitely is here. This is a far better camera. In fact, this is a better camera today than maybe the uh, GH5 was back in 2017. You would hope so with the progress of technology and things like that. But here are the things that really stuck out to me. So after sending back the Canon R8, I wanted the R8 initially. I wanted to see whether or not it would be a good all-purpose type of camera, not necessarily for professional stuff, but I could take it on professional stuff if I wanted to. I thought it was gonna be portable and small, something like the EOS M6 Mark II, um, or even the ZV-E10, right? These are tiny, tiny, small cameras, even with the cage built out on it, it's small. But the R8, I guess with the added viewfinder, um, and it's, it's not that much bigger than this, right? Now this also feels a lot better in the hand. Definitely thicker than the uh, R8, right? And which is not that big of a problem. Thickness of a camera is not a problem for me. It has to do with its height. Um, and my thing is that, you know, if, if I can't do anything about the height, I might as well have a good, I guess, good time handling the camera in the hand. So uh, with relation to size, again, comparison to the R8, it's not that much bigger. So, but this also feels really good in the hand. And what's interesting is I've held the R5 also. A buddy of mine had it and um, they're about the same size. And I remember when I was holding that camera, it feels really solid. And this brings me to my next point, which has to do with image stabilization. Now, there's you know, the trifecta of having a good image. We're not talking about exposure, but we're talking about um, it has to do with, you know, the quality of the light that's coming into the camera. We're not talking about the lens, but lens is part of it. The light that's coming into the camera, are you exposed appropriately? Um, is the camera, uh, is the audio good that's coming into the camera? And the third major factor is, is the image stabilized enough? The default that you want to settle on is having a stable image as opposed to a shaky one. One of the best ways to stabilize your image is obviously put it on to put on some sticks like a stabilizer perhaps. Um, but one of the things that definitely helps, which is one of the reasons why I genuinely appreciated and admired uh, the capability of the uh, GH5 is the fact that it had in-body image stabilization. Now, I have worked without in-body image stabilization on numerous occasions and for years, uh, and most recently utilizing technology like GyroFlow, using the gyro data off of an Insta360 or the gyro data that is recorded within Sony cameras, right? They have that you can then use Catalyst Browse or GyroFlow, right? Uh, and on Canon EOS M6 Mark II, there's an enhanced digital IS. It's not even close. It's not, it doesn't even match the quality of gyro flow or in-body image stabilization, but it's not bad if you're not like moving around like, you know, crazy person. <laughs> and so one of the things I was hoping was that the quality and what I would get from enhanced digital IS from the R8 was going to be something along the lines of what I was getting from the EOS M6 Mark II, which was not the reality due to whatever head stabilization the camera was doing. The R6 Mark II has in-body image stabilization. So I knew going in when I was renting this camera 
that I was not going to have digital IS. Although it does have the ability to enable it, I wasn't gonna try it because I already knew the issues with it. And so for that reason, the IBIS kind of became a must have, especially for situations where, cause I was using a uh, 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens. Having that stability, the lens had IS, the body had IS and regular digital stabilization. So the triple stabilization was really, really helpful when it came to shooting. So that's one of the things that uh, basically having IBIS made up for whatever digital IS issues that came into play. And now coming out of this, I'm just like, you know what? Like that IS is great because now I'm not actually I've like several times I just took this out for fun and family outings and things like that. And I didn't even bother more or less with uh, attaching my uh, GoPro, uh, not my GoPro. <laughs> my Insta360, I didn't bother attaching this. Now, the reason I attach this, I usually put it right here on the side so that I can get the gyro data uh, from this to stabilize my camera. But the IBIS is good enough for me to not have to worry about even basic stabilization. So unless I'm gonna run around with this, typically when I have this lens mounted or anything wider, I will gyro stabilize uh, with this lens. But for the most part, I didn't have to. I can depend on the ibis so long as i'm not running around with it if i'm doing basic panning you know adjusting holding you know maybe even slow walking the ibis works just fine that's definitely something that i appreciate now the other thing that really comes out to is the way that the sd card slots are designed so one of the things i appreciate is the fact that the entry to the sd cards is on the side right and you got dual sd cards and basically i found myself not having to replace the sd cards at all and whenever I had anything rigged up underneath, even if I were blocking the battery compartment, it wasn't a big deal because I could get access to the SD card um, as I needed. Uh, for whatever reason, when the SD card fills up in this, it doesn't automatically go to the second one. Now, I don't know uh, if that's a feature I have to enable. I went through the menu, I couldn't find anything uh, specific to that, or maybe I'm missing something. Uh, maybe that's a user error, and if it is, do tell me. Um, I would like to know how to enable that, or is that some if the, is that a feature that's available in the R6 Mark II? Because having dual card slots is great. Having the ability to automatically start recording to the other card is even better. And for whatever reason, as a default, that's not the case. And I don't know how to enable that. So if you do know, let me know. Um, so, but other than the fact that having the two SD cards and having the entry being from the side, this has got to be a default. Stop putting SD card entry from the bottom. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I get you want to make the card uh, camera compact, but even compact cameras should have a decent grip. And if you're going to give me a decent grip, you can put a decent battery size. And if you're going to put a decent battery size, you also now have the space for the SD card. Compactness has to do with the height of the camera, right? Not so much the width or the thickness of it, at least for me. So uh, every camera should have SD card access from the side. Uh, at least that's the case for me. So now that brings me on to the image quality and recording settings. I almost exclusively recorded 4K60 on this without any problems, without any worry, without any thought of it, it's gonna overheat. Now, did the overheating indicator come on at any point? Yes. Uh, but even in that situation, after several hours of recording, especially during the wedding, um, uh, when I, we were, so there are two days to the wedding on day one, in both situations, we were indoors. And on day one, after several hours of recording, now not continuous on and off, after several hours of recording 4K60 of this thing fully rigged up, even like in it, and it was rigged up in a way that I'm sure it was, it was making it difficult for heat dissipation. And I got the, the heat indicator to get to maybe three or four bars. Uh, there was another situation where I took this outside um, at, in the evening, but it was hot and humid, like 88, 90, something like that. And after about 30 or 40 minutes of recording. So check this out. We've been recording 4K60 for a little while now. And I finally got the overheating indicator to come on. So <laughs> there we go. It took a while though. I've been recording like this for about maybe 30 minutes before the overheating indicator came on. And I still have at least two thirds battery life. I got the heat indicator to get to like maybe four bars. And at the same time, we were also recording outdoors um, just on and off uh, 4K60 
um, at a coffee shop. Um, and it was basically a regular outing from going to my brother-in-law's place, playing with his dog, and then later going out and uh, having coffee. And it was all outdoors. And in that situation, I did not see the heat indicator come on once, which is in stark contrast to the experience that I had with the Canon R8. Now the Canon R8 did not overheat on me, but the stress of the heat indicator reaching halfway on the regular was something that kind of stood out to me. So in terms of being able to operate this camera with relation to temperature use, and also this camera didn't feel nearly as warm as the Canon R8 did. So uh, the fact that I can confidently take this out in 90 degree Houston temperatures out in the sun um, and know that I can continue recording is definitely helpful. Now that brings me on to the last but not least most important factor is the battery life. The battery life is good right now i'll tell you how good the battery life is now i found myself in a situation where the first day of the wedding um i had actually prepared to power this through the v-mount battery that i have um via a dummy battery that i had purchased now i had purchased a dummy battery that fit uh, physically but it did not fit um voltage wise in the sense that it did not drive enough power it wasn't designed for the canon r6 mark ii and I said, okay, no problem. I will buy it for the next day. In the meantime, I'll just operate off of the battery that's inside. Now, I had plugged it into charge. Unfortunately, I left the power button on. And so uh, at some point, uh, the battery died out. And so uh, the next morning I go in to see, uh, get ready. And as we're leaving for the wedding, my battery's dead. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't go to this wedding with a dead battery. So what do I do? Well, so you gotta make sure that this switch is turned off when you're charging. Basically plugged it into my phone charger in the car on the way, which was maybe a 30 to 40 minute drive. And then I also got a backup battery pack that I would use for my cell phone. And I plugged it in and this thing charged almost maybe halfway and then i anytime i wasn't recording i was charging this thing and i got through the entire wedding um with just enough battery before it died that love that allah placed in the heart of a person that is something that emanates from that person it's like a light that spreads to everyone it's like a beautiful fragrance that everyone can smell because that person, Allah loves them. That's muhabba. When you think about Allah being one, it's only mentioned once, muhabba. Whereas hope is mentioned many, many times. One of those manifestations perhaps of muhabba, perhaps, I think that may be found in Tamran and Faria today. They love to take care of other people. Perhaps this is a muhabba from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like a beautiful perfume that other people can smell. It's like a light that emanates. Like Ibn al-Qayyim says, whoever has the same attribute as one of the attributes of Allah, that attribute will lead the person by its tight reins. It will allow him to enter on his Lord and bring him closer to his mercy. Why? Because Allah is merciful and loves those who are merciful. Allah is generous and he loves those who are generous. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst people that can have tawakkul within our marriages, to make them peaceful, full of love and mercy between ourselves, and that we are able to complete one another, to overlook other each other's faults, and see each other from the lens of the love of Allah. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless Kamran and Fariha, bless their children. Barakallahu lak wa baraka alayka wa jama'a baynakuma fi fayn. May Allah bless you, may He shower you with your blessings, and may He join you in khayr. That tells me something with relation to the Canon R8 when I was using the battery on that. I went to three batteries. And uh, and that too, I f like was barely enough to get through maybe a couple of hours of recording. Whereas with this, I was able to go through all day on and off charging. Now the second day, I went in with the V-mount battery. The V-mount battery was charging the camera. It was charging the monitor. It was charging um, my Insta360. It was charging basically everything. And 
I had no issues with relation to battery life. Went through the entire afternoon and evening, um, and I still had juice to spare on the V-mount because it's a V-mount, right? And at the same time, whenever I took this out for some family stuff, whether it was, you know, hanging out with the brother-in-law, um, going out for coffee, um, just shenanigans, capturing family stuff, um, I did not once have to worry about charging this battery. So as a regular everyday carry type of thing, yeah, it's a little bit big, but it fits in my bag without a problem. And uh, as a result, I don't have to worry about, you know, losing battery. And if I, for any reason, I'm doing a lot of recording or capturing uh, and my battery's running low, I can just plug it into my phone charger and I will be fine. So again, as a quick review and summary of this camera, uh, my suggestion is for anybody who is starting out and is serious about getting into content creation, right? Whether it be for things like YouTube or education or, um, just personal shenanigans or maybe even client work. This is a great first camera to get into and it will also allow you room to grow into it as well. Um, coupled with the fact that yes, it's an RF mount, but with the appropriate adapter, I have an RF to EF Viltrox adapter. You have a slew of EF lenses. I'm all about EF lenses. I couldn't care less about RF lenses at this moment uh, or at this point in time, because so many EF lenses are really, really good. Uh, if I were to consider one RF lens, just one, uh, it would be the 35 millimeter f1.8, simply because of the focal length is super versatile. Um, and so uh, if I were to carry just one lens, it would be that. But personally, I like the 40 mil, which is what I've been rocking here. It's a small lens, but if you get the 35 RF, uh, it is probably about the same size as this. An alternative, perhaps, on the RF mount, the newly released, if I'm not mistaken, 28 millimeter F, is it 2.8, if I'm not mistaken? It's a new pancake lens. That would be a good lens to have, um, whether you're on an APS-C, like an R10 or an R7, uh, but especially if you're on a full frame with the uh, R6 Mark II or the R5. So, but those would be the only two lenses I would consider um, as an RF, native RF mount lens in the scope of affordability, but there's so many native EF lenses that you can definitely rely on. So now what would make this the perfect camera? Um, essentially, if they did a few things, right? Uh, if they won, they chopped off that viewfinder, that would be one item. The other thing is the HDMI port. Yeah, it is a uh, micro HDMI, as you can see here. Uh, now, starting out, at least in the short term, it's not a big deal, but the issue with micro HDMI, as you can see, is that over time, it will break. Um, I have a GH4 with micro HDMI and that is pretty much gone. Uh, uh, and on several other cameras where I have micro HDMI, over time, after several years of plugging in and out, um, it's gonna give at some point. And having a full-size HDMI, kind of like I do right here, on the GH5, that's something that great benefit if they were to make that design change. Now I understand firmware update to fix that enhanced digital IS, stop trying to stabilize for the head. Let us worry about that as a user. The interesting thing is two of those three are a non-issue on a competitive camera, which is the Panasonic S5 Mark II. And so I am looking forward to testing that out later in the future, but S5 Mark II does have a full-size HDMI port. Um, it does have uh, IBIS just like this, and it does have like an enhanced version of the digital IS, uh, which doesn't have, you know, any kind of head issues. And so, um, but it does have a viewfinder, but that's something that's, um, I mean, I get it. It's a hybrid camera. Photographers want to be able to do this. And so 
Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, two of those three can be found um, in a Panasonic camera. So I'm wondering how that compares to the R6 Mark II. But again, that's an exploration of curiosity for another day. In the meantime, though, in the way that this thing is, um, I can definitely see myself buying into this uh, in the near future, especially as the used camera, right? It's 2,500 brand new. I'm sure one can find it for less than that uh, in maybe a year's time uh, at about maybe close to 2,000 or less. So I look forward to seeing that. I'm also curious to seeing. Um, so one of the things that I like to do in relation to how I shoot is um, in addition to the videos that I capture, I will take a lot of frame grabs as photos. So that's one of the reasons I like to shoot at a higher shutter speed because some of the frame grabs look like photos if I process and grade them properly. It's kind of like editing a JPEG with uh, with a log profile. Essentially, that's what a video uh, in uh, some sort of log profile is. Um, but the thing that I wish is that I would be able to use an entire, like for example, on the Panasonic, they give you 6K um, open gate. And so if I had that opportunity with the Canon, that will also be an additional perk. And that's one of the reasons the S5 Mark II is also seemingly more attractive. Even the S1H has that attractive factor is where you get open gate so I can record and I can capture frames from that. That's also one of the reasons why the R5, if they come out with a Mark II, um, it would also be attractive because of the fact that if I'm recording video and it doesn't, I don't have to worry about overheating anything like that. 8K 45 megapixel still frame captures as photos. And then with video, I have that flexibility of downsampling that in the edit and not in the, not necessarily in the recording of, within the camera itself. Uh, and I get the flexibility of having a wide and a tight in the same shot, uh, as opposed to, it's kind of like having a multi-camera uh, set up in your hands because you're shooting at 8K and you can crop into 4K or not. So that's it. This is my quick review of the EOS M6, no, EOS R6. Uh, I'm recording on the M6 right now, but this is the EOS R6 Mark II. Quick review. Hope you guys found value in this. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. I'll see you soon.